Thank you for the introduction. First, I would like to, to mention that Martin is not here because uh, he has a problem with the air company. But uh, for the surprise of many of, uh, of, of you, perhaps, it was not a problem with the as Argentina. It was Air France. <laughs> and it's important to mention this because I've been uh, abroad for four years, and the last time I came here was in 2012, two years ago. And it was, was quite sad now that I'm here, to realize that the common sense in Argentina is that everything bad happens in this country. And it's not true. <laughs> this can happen also in the so-called first world. However, now I, um, I will start with, the, with my talk. Uh, Martin is a very good speaker, he's very funny, so I will, I will do my best to, to keep you awake after such a nice evening we spent together yesterday. Uh, so the, the, um, the title of, the, of his talk was non coding RNAs in Root Developmental Plasticity and he was planning to talk uh, about my project and another one that, was, that is being held in, in, in our lab, in our group. Uh, I will focus on my project that I manage better. So my title, my own title is non coding transcription by alternative RNA polymerases regulate chromatin loop, loop dynamics and this has an effect on uh, root development and plasticity, so it is uh, following his, his idea of the talk. So, uh, what are long non coding RNAs? As they, they are called, they, they are genes that are transcribed but they don't encode any protein. And they can be classified according to their uh, position in the genome. So, we can find here in blue you can see protein coding genes and in red uh, long non coding RNA genes, and uh, they can be called antisense transcripts if they are overlapped, as, as you can see here, to protein coding genes, or they can be intronic uh, non coding RNAs if they are encoded in the, within an intron of, a, <coughs> of the protein coding gene. So, we, we can also find divergent long non coding RNAs, as, as in this case, that is like uh, going through the promoter region, the protein and promoter region of a protein coding gene, or uh, we can find an intergenic region, intergenic coding protein coding genes on both types, or on both sides, and we find the long non coding RNA in between. <laughs> Most of the advances for the understanding of the role of long non coding RNAs have been had place in, in, in mammals, uh, or in, in animals in general, as for example this one, panda RNA, that is in, in charge of uh, taking a protein, a chromatin binding protein, away from, uh, from the chromatin, in this case of panda RNA is taking away a transcription factor, um, so as to prevent the transcription factor to, to control its target gene. Also, uh, very well known non non coding RNA is hot air that is, acts as a, as a scaffold to conform a protein complex that needs to be together. These proteins need to be together, but they don't interact between each other directly, but they do it uh, through the action of a very well structured long non coding RNA. Another case is of those uh, long non coding RNAs that can bring <coughs> and guide proteins to the chromatin. And this can, be do, this can be done directly by interacting the long coding RNA with the DNA or alternatively through uh, proteins that are binding to, to the DNA. So this is the case of, for example, cyst or air RNAs that can bring uh, remodeling complexes that will uh, trigger histone post-translational modifications. So another very nice example of a long non coding RNAs interacting with chromatin is the case of hot RNA that can put together an enhancer, enhancer element with the proximal promoter of a gene uh, through the action of the through the interaction of the long non coding RNA with DNA and the, on the other side with proteins that will uh, interact with the proximal promoter of the gene. So somehow uh, affecting through the action of the long non coding RNA the expression of the target gene. In plants, there are very few long non coding RNAs that have been characterized up to now. Uh, this one in Medicago truncatula is, uh, it was first described in our lab 10 years ago. And this non coding RNA, Inod40, 
is expressed throughout modulation in the cyanobetric uh, interaction with bacteria for nitrogen fixation. And this uh, RNA is uh, capable of binding an RNA binding protein and taking, the, taking it away. I don't know if here we can see very well. Oh, well, when the, the RNA is there, we, if we can find the protein in the nucleus as well as in the cytoplasm. Uh, we can see the, the dots here. But when we, uh, with the control uh, cells, the protein is only in the nucleus. Later, uh, we studied this uh, uh, complex, uh, the, the homologous complex of RBP1 in anabiopsis, what we called an, uh, NSR, and uh, we found another structurated RNA that we called alternative splicing uh, competitor RNA that can um, affect the alternative splicing of those genes that are uh, regulated by this uh, alternative splicer, uh, splicing regulator. Martin was going to focus his talk on this uh, work, uh, work that we published this year in, in the developmental cell and we had the pleasure and the honor that uh, Alberto Cornet wrote a preview, a comment on this in the same issue and uh, his, in his own words uh, he described that we achieved to elucidate how long highly structurated non-coding RNAs control alternative splicing regulators by specifically mediate that, that specifically mediate the action of the hormone oxygen, oxygen in the promotion of lateral root growth in aridopsis. Um, another non-coding RNA that has been described in plants is IPS1, it is called uh, induced by phosphate preservation 1. That is a long non-coding RNA that can mimic the target site of a microRNA, in this case, mid 399. But the base pairing is quite imperfect, so that it can, <coughs> this long non-coding RNA, what uh, can do is to kidnap the microRNA and prevent the real target to be cut and degraded. So when this long non-coding RNA is transcribed, then the, the real target will be trans, uh, translated into the into functional protein, whereas when this long non-coding RNA is not there, uh, the, the, the real target will not achieve translation. And perhaps the best described long non-coding RNA in plants is the one uh, controlling uh, flowering locus C, that we have uh, heard about this gene uh, throughout the conference, and this, long, uh, this uh, gene that encodes for a transcription factor that is essential for uh, the transition from vegetative to flowering uh, stages in, in plants is uh, very well um, controlled by an antisense long non coding RNA, Pulear, that will change its uh, alternative splicing uh, profile in response to vernalization, and this will trigger. It is thought that through the action of uh, an intergenic, and, and, sorry, an electronic uh, non-coding RNA that will be transcribed later, but this, there are some controversies about this, uh, but this will trigger somehow the methylation of histones that are in this region that will shut down the, the expression of this gene. Uh, so, up to now, we are talking about long non-coding RNAs transcribed that by Pol2 in general, so they are cut, they are polyadenylated. But in plants, there is also another mechanism that will trigger DNA methylation. It's what, what we call RNA-dependent DNA methylation. This mechanism begins by the transcription of a, another polymerase, Pol4, of a long non-coding RNA that will be uh, transformed in a double-stranded RNA by the action of uh, an interactive protein that is called RDR2, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase 2. This double-stranded RNA will be cleaved into 24 nucleotides siRNAs by DICER3 like, uh, DICER like 3 complex, and these small RNAs will be loaded in an EGO4 uh, complex, and this interaction will recognize another long non-coding RNA that is being transcribed by POL5 in this case, and this interaction will trigger DNA methylation of its own locus and adjacent, adjacent regions. So, what is the effect of this DNA methylation? It will change the configuration of the chromatin. And there are marks, histone modification marks, and DNA marks 
that will open the chromatin into what we call new chromatin that will be available for transcription, whereas there are other um, marks, other modifications, epigenetic marks, among which we can find DNA methylation that will close DNA in a very compact way and it will, be, it will, be not, uh, will not be uh, available for, for transcription. For transcription. There are also histone variants that can modify the configuration of a, of a chromatin. So in general terms, we can find very densely packed uh, chromatin uh, around the centromere, as, as we can see here, there is heterochromatin, and the rest of the chromosome, we can find also in general terms, new chromatin, that is will, uh, where, where we can find all those genes that are actively transcribed. If we take a look at the distribution of 24 nucleotide cyRNAs, we can find that they are mostly located uh, around the centromeres. So it makes sense. This region is highly methylated and it is very well compact. So up to now we were talking about the, the first level of organization of chromatin. DNA is packed, packed into, into chromatin. Uh, by interacting with histones, but at the same time there is another level of organization that is, that is what we call genome topology. For many years we thought that uh, genome topology that consists of the, intera oh, uh, in the interaction of uh, certain uh, regions of chromosomes with each other or regions of the same chromosome which is with each other uh, we thought that it was random, there was no organization, in the, there was no control of what parts of the chromosomes were uh, contacting each other. But what we knew for a very long time is that this organization depends or, on, on RNA, because if we add, uh, add it to a culture of cells, RNAs, we could disrupt these interactions and disorganize the nucleus of the cell. I like very much this cover of Science Journal in 2008 because it can summarize uh, in a very nice way the, all the steps or main steps of gene expression regulation. So we can be, see here transcription, processing, RNA processing, uh, the polyannulated and capped RNA comes out of the nucleus, it, can, it goes through uh, the translation, there are microarrays here. <coughs> but what I like the most of this slide, this cover, is that if we take a look at the, of the uh, DNA, we can see here DNA wrapping uh, histones, what we call a nucleosome, but also we can find these white bars that represent the contacts of chromosomes with each other, suggesting already six years ago that genome topology was somehow controlling gene expression uh, in, in in living cells. So, in our lab, before I arrived for my postdoc, um, a group of bioinformaticians took all the databases available in, 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 in Arabiopsis of mRNAs, ESTs, and so on, and what they did was to select those that had very small open reading frames, and there were other uh, characteristics to let us think that these RNAs were not calling for proteins. For example, there were several ADG before the first opening reading frame. And this, is, this has been characterized that the, the ribosome can uh, recognize the first ADGs, but if there is no open reading frames, that it gets off the, the RNA and the RNA is not, trans uh, not translated. So, uh, what they did was to characterize uh, several of those, they checked if they were really being transcribed and if they were induced by, by stress or hormones or whatever. And they achieved to prepare a list of 76 long non coding RNAs, noble long non coding RNAs in plants in, in, in Arabidopsis, uh, that we could detect by an ordinary RT qPCR. And by now we know by several works, especially after the, the RNA sequencing technology, that there are plenty of non -coding, long non coding RNAs in, in plants. In Arabidopsis, we find at least more than 3,000 um, in, in, in control conditions, and as soon as we are 
obtaining of the data of uh, different treatments, organs, or whatever, we keep enlarging the, the, the existence of non non coding RNAs in other species. And the same thing in other plant species that have been already described. So, for my puzzle project, we chose a few long non coding RNAs that had a very particular uh, profile in the genome. This is uh, the, the one I'm going to talk about uh, today is called Apollo, after oxygen regulated promoter loop RNA. We will see later why we call this, this RNA like this. But in general terms, all those RNAs that we chose for characterization had a very particular profile. On the one hand, we can see that the, the RNA exists, long RNA exists, it came from EST databases, it was thought to be polyadenylated and capped, but at the same time, there was a 24 nucleotide production coming from this locus, and that uh, hints the existence of this pathway for DNA methylation, and at the same time, this locus was highly methylated. So it is not in the central here, it is in between, them, in between genes that are normally transcribed, and it is a region, a very small region, this is 700 uh, pair bases, a uh, very small region that is heterochromatin in between euchromatin. And at the same time, we can detect a, a long RNA coming from there. So it was quite tricky, and uh, we decided to, to go deep in, into it. Um, if, if we take a look to another browser available on the web, we see that this methylation and the production of 24 nucleotide siRNA correlates with a chip seek analysis of Pol5. So everything makes sense. This is being recognized by Pol4 and Pol5. It produces 24 nucleotide siRNA and it is highly methylated. So it is heterochromatin. At the same time, we detect a long methylated RNA. So what we did is to take, it was is taking a double mutant of Pol4 and Pol5, so abolishing. The, the pathway of, of methylation, and by performing five prime rays, we could still detect a capped uh, transcript coming from this locus. So it is not only Pol4 and Pol5 recognizing this locus, but also Pol2. So this is the situation of Apollo. It's a long intergenic non coding RNA coming to the previous classification I mentioned at the beginning, and it is between uh, two genes. Uh, this one was never related to the behavior of, of Apollo, but this one that is about 5 kb upstream the beginning of the gene, this one is PID, or also known as PINOID, uh, gene that encodes for a kinase that is in, in charge of localizing the PIN2 transcription, uh, PIN2 uh, oxygen efflux transporter in the root cell so as to um, uh, control oxygen transport in the, in, in the root. And we know that this gene is an oxygen responsive gene. So, what we did is a treatment of oxygens that you will see throughout the, the talk that consists of uh, treating for three days the seedlings with MPA. It's an agent that will block oxygen transport and it will prevent plants to uh, conform to producing lateral roots. And all of a sudden, we transfer the, the seedlings to NAA, synthetic oxygen, that will trigger the formation of lateral roots in a coordinated way. They, they are synchronized. We can see all the lateral roots growing at the same time. And for this, uh, we took samples every three hours for all the experiments we've performed uh, afterwards. So in this case, we took RNA and we analyzed RNA levels of both genes and we saw that P is induced up to 12 hours, it picks up to 12 hours and then it goes down again. And very similarly, even if lower induction, we can see that Apollo non coding RNA goes up and then it goes down in response to oxygen. So, what we did is to knock down Apollo RNA by uh, an RNAi approach and uh, we achieved in a stable Arabidopsis plant to, to reduce uh, Apollo RNA levels. But what we found very uh, surprising is that PIT transcript levels were also uh, reduced even if there was absolutely no sequence similarity between the two, gene, two genes. 
So Pig Newton has a very particular phenotype in the root. It's a very mild phenotype in the root that consists in a, in a, in a delayed response uh, to gravity tropism. So it, we, we performed uh, a, band, a bending assay. We take the plate and we bend it uh, with our RNA plants, and we uh, analyzed the, the angle of curvature of the, of, the, of the root, and we saw that there is a delayed response in, in, in our plants, and it was already described five years ago for Pete Milton. So by knocking down Apollo, we are uh, Phenocopying the, 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 the phenotype of the pig mutant and controlling it uh, somehow, we, we didn't know how, uh, in transcription. So, uh, we kept analyzing all the browsers available on the web to try to characterize, considering that long non coding RNAs in, in, in mammals are uh, very well uh, linked to chromatin modifications, and we knew that this. Locus was uh, highly methylated. We analyzed what uh, histone modification marks were characterizing this locus. The first one that we found is H3K27 triangulation. That's a very typical um, repressive mark of transcription of genes. But what we found is not what we call a canonical mark for, for a gene. When this mark is repressing a gene, in general we find it across, throughout the gene or the, the, the promoter. And in this case, we found a peak, a peak promoter. When we did our own experiments only with roots, we found also a peak here at the <coughs> 5 prime of, the, of this gene, and another peak at Apollo. And this was separated by, by, about, by about 5 kV. Furthermore, we found by chip uh, qPCR, that these marks were modulated in response to oxygen. And you see this type of graph is always the same uh, oxygen kinetics that I, I mentioned before, NPA, NPA. So, we know that this PRC2 mark, H3K27 uh, trimethylation, is maintained by another uh, complex that is PRC1, especially through the binding of LHP1. Uh, I think it was uh, Alberto Gormit who mentioned HP1 in, in, in animals, heterochromatin protein 1. This one is like heterochromatin protein 1. Uh, this protein can bind to this mark to maintain the gene repressed. What we found is that this uh, mark, this, this protein was binding to this mark as expected, but also a little bit spread across the gene bodies. Also, we found that we, we performed chip, chip against LHP1, and we found that this mark was all, all also regulated uh, throughout the oxygen kinetics. So, we knew that LHP1 can conform homodimers through its C-terminal domain. So, we were brainstorming around the round table, uh, with trying to figure out what was going on and how a polar transcription can regulate peak transcription, and we say, okay, this mark is here, this mark is here, we have uh, proteins binding here and here that can conform homodimers. What if these two loci are put together through a chromatin group uh, mediated by LHP1? So to address this question, we perform what is called chromatin conformation capture, so-called 3C, that works by, uh, by cross-linking with formaldehyde, uh, the chromatin, proteins, and DNA together, then we choose a restriction enzyme that cuts at least twice in between these two sites. We dilute the, a lot the sample up to 7 milliliters to put all the molecules present in the sample away from each other, and we relegate. And after reverse cross-linking, if there were really proteins putting these two sites together, we will be able to amplify this library by PCR. If not, these two parts of DNA will be uh, put apart, and this PCR will never work. So in our case, we chose BGL2, that uh, cut uh, twice in between Apollo and PIP, and there was in between about 3.5 kV. And what we can see here 
And this band is quite fading here, but in this one you can really see it. And it corresponds to the relegation of this side with this side, meaning that uh, these two sides were cut and they were put together uh, by relegation. So there was somebody mediating the interaction between this part of the, of the chromosome and this one. This one that you can see here is the positive control to, to measure that we really have DNA in the sample. But what was really striking and what we were really happy to see is that these bands were not detectable in the LHP1 mutant, suggesting that LHP1 was really mediating the formation of the loop. So once we knew that these two sites were being relegated, we could design primers for qPCR and measure, quantitatively measure, the, the, the formation of the loop in different, in different plan lines. And when we're calling, considering 100% the formation of the loop in wild-type plants, what we saw is that the formation of the loop was enhanced in RNAi plants and re, uh, reduced or impaired Partially, even if we couldn't detect it here, we could detect by QPCR the formation of the loop in the LHP1 mutant, suggesting that both the RNA and the protein are mediating the formation of the loop or are regulating somehow the formation of the loop. So again, we said, okay, the loop is there. How is it modulated? How is it modulated in response to oxygen? So we performed the kinetics for this 3C, and what we found is that the loop is quickly opened when the RNA begins to go up. And then it becomes, uh, it begins to be reconformed throughout the, the, the treatment with uh, exogenous oxygen when the RNAs were going down. We then analyzed how this, uh, what, what, what was the behavior of the loop in the LHP1 mutant. Uh, what we found is, of course, the basal levels were uh, lower than the wild type. It gets open very, very quickly, but it, it, it is significantly uh, lower the rate of reconformation of the, of the loop. So it is somehow impaired the reformation of the loop. And this correlates with the higher expression of, of PID in response to auxins. This is wild type in black. In, in red, we can see LHP1 mutant. And we see that uh, it peaks at 12 hours, but at a higher level, and it gets quite some trouble to, to, to go down again. So we know that LHP1 belongs to the family of uh, chromodomain proteins, whose members from it is the only member in the plant kingdom. Uh, but the members of this family from the animal kingdom can bind to RNA. So we wonder whether LHP1 could bind to our RNA, Apollo, that was somehow also interacting with this region and controlling uh, loop formation. Uh, fortunately, we found by immunoprecipitation. LHP1 and carrying out uh, reverse transcription and QPCR, that uh, Apollo was there. Furthermore, the interaction between LHP1 and Apollo that we can see in blue here correlates very nicely with loop formation. So, when the loop is open, the interaction is broken, and then when the loop begins to be reconformed, look at this, it correlates perfectly. We know that we cannot trust correlations to, to get conclusions very quickly, but it was hinting that the interaction between LHP1 and Apollo had something to do with loop formation. So, uh, what we did to analyze if the RNA, Apollo RNA, had some, something to do at the level of interaction with chromatin here, is performing a, what we call chromatin isolation by RNA purification. It is a sort of cheat, but instead of Immunoprecipitating the protein, what we do is to purify the RNA. And we do this by using uh, biotinylated DNA groups that will base pair our RNA, and then we can uh, purify this complex using uh, streptoidine magnetic beads. So then, after this, we purify the DNA and we can uh, amplify by qPCR, or we can also build a library and go for sequencing. But in our case, we uh, up to now, <coughs> what we did was to, to analyze which, which regions were interacting with our long non coding RNA. And what we found was really nice because we saw here you have two sets of the independent set of proofs uh, purifying Apollo. And what we found is that Apollo is interacting with the 5' uh, region of PID, also with its own region, Apollo, but it is not interacting 
uh, in between these two genes, that is the region that is encompassing in in the, 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 the loop. So somehow Apollo is, is interacting with its own region, this one that is going like across the borders of the loop, but not in between them. The RNA that we are purifying here is the pole 2 transcript, this is the long transcript, because we are purifying something that we can also amplify by QPCR, it's a long, long encoding RNA. What we mentioned before, that this locus was also transcribed by pole 4 and pole 5, and uh, by the production of small RNAs, it could, it could trigger DNA methylation. So we knew that the long encoding RNA, with the help of LHP1, was helping to conform the, the loop. But we wanted to know to the shipper why this mark was there. So we said, okay, we will take all these mutants and assess how the loop is behaving. What are the loop dynamics in these mutants in response to options? We never achieved to characterize the kinetics only because the loop doesn't exist when this uh, pathway has no place. In all these mutants, the loop is abolished. And I think that this is the most important result that we have from, the, from, the, um, from this work because we are saying, uh, we are stating that DNA, RNA dependent DNA methylation is the essential mark for loop formation at least in low, in low site where uh, of, 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 that they are in the context of euchromatin is a very small region of heterochromatin that can be dynamically modulated and it, is, it has an impact on uh, genome topology. So we took one of these mutants and we analyzed how PID transcription was behaving and we saw that it is highly induced by auxins, by, yes, by auxins, up to five, uh, 150 voltage and it gets quite a lot of, tra of travel to, to all. <coughs> Altogether we can say that the loop is controlling PID promoter uh, after its induction. So it, it, it needs to be pre-conformed the loop to prevent transcription of this loci. So, what we did next is to analyze the DNA methylation of this locus, uh, because after the results we had, we knew that DNA methylation has a, quite an importance in, in the formation of the loop. And what we can see here, for example, is that in the RNA guidelines where we, we detected an enhanced formation of the loop, uh, DNA methylation is also uh, higher than in the wild type. And we said, okay, let's see how DNA methylation behaves in the auxin kinetics. And here we can see the, the DNA methylation in, in response to auxins in blue, and we can see that it goes down very quickly uh, together with the opening of the loop, and then it goes up together with the reformation of the loop. So we were really, and this also has a, a, an inverted correlation with pol 2 deposition of, of these locus. That it makes sense because when pol 2 is there, of course there is transcription. Uh, this is active pol 2. And it goes down with the transcription of PID and Apollo goes down. So we were really happy with, with this uh, result, but there was a colleague, Martin colleague, Martin's colleague, who came and said, okay, if I, I really like your results, but I cannot believe that it, this happens so quickly without active DNA demethylation. I mean, there are not so many cell divisions throughout three hours to say that this is due to this. I mean, there should be somebody mediating DNA demethylation in response to auxins. So, he gave us uh, RDD triple mutant that's absolutely impaired in active DNA demethylation. And we analyzed what happened with the loop formation. So, here in green, what we can see is that the basal levels of the loop formation in the RDD mutant is seven times higher than the wild type. And then it takes, instead of taking three hours to, to, to get open the loop, it takes up to 12, hour, 12 hours to, to achieve the same level. Meaning that the loop formation, loop opening in response to auxin is absolutely mediated by RDD uh, complex. If we compare our PID transcription in this mutant, well, here is also the Apollo RNA, I, and then we can see that, of course, if the loop is more efficiently conformed, it has problems to, to, to get uh, induced by oxygen. This is wild type and this, these lines of RNAi and RDD that are impaired in, in oxygen production. So altogether, 
we can we can propose that, that if here is a field and here is a follow, there is a chromatin loop, uh, encompassing field promoter that is daily conformed, and it is maintained by mainly by DNA methylation and the uh, binding of uh, LHP1. Uh, but this loop will be opened in response to oxygen through the action of active DNA demethylation. Once the loop is open, we have the promoter available for the recognition of transcription factors as well as POL2, and divergent transcription will have place for both of PID and Apollo. PID transcripts go, will go out of the nucleus for uh, translation, and the long non coding RNA transcription, POL2, long non coding RNA transcription, will be in charge of recruiting LHP1 again to reconfirm the loop. And there is a paper, a very nice piece of work in 2009 in Genes and Health, <coughs> demonstrating that intergenic non non coding transcription by POL2 is in charge of recruiting POL4 and POL5 to trigger DNA methylation of those loci. So we think that. Paul 2 transcript is in charge of recruiting LHP1 to reconfirm the loop, but at the same time, Paul 2 will recruit Paul 4 and Paul 5 to trigger uh, this uh, mechanism of RNA dependent DNA methylation that will end by methylating this locus and stabilizing the loop again. So at the end, the loop will be reconfirmed and uh, maintained by mainly by DNA methylation. RNA, uh, Apollo RNA that we know that interacts with this, the two sides of the loop and LHP1 that is binding to this region. When we discussed a lot in the, in the lab uh, why this would take place in, 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 the, in the route, we had a quite a reasonable hypothesis of this, and is that P is an oxy uh, responsive gene. However, it's expression pattern does not correlate with the oxygen peak in the root. So, for example, DR5, that is one uh, marker of the uh, oxygen response, does not correlate with the, the expression pattern of PID. And it makes sense, because PID will be related to oxygen transport. So if PID is an oxygen responsive gene, and this is accumulated where the peak of oxygen is there, it will take oxygen away again. So, it needs to be expressed in those cells that need to transport oxygen, but it cannot be present where the peak is, where oxygen are accumulated, because if peak is there, it will go up elsewhere again. So the regulation of the of peak should be very uh, well uh, controlled, because excess an excess of peak will cause a, 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 a disaster in root development. Indeed, the overexpression of, of peak has other roots and. It, it, Great disorder in <coughs> oxygen accumulation in the world. So, thanks for your attention. This is our group. This is Martin here. These are the people working in our uh, in the project uh, together with me. And these are co uh, collaborators, who, collaborators who introduced me to the epigenetic studies and nucleus uh, biochemistry. So, I'm really grateful to all of them. Um, thank you, and I'm happy to be with you. that can function redundantly because you still have some loop formation when you, in the LHP mutants. Well, I answer this one? I, yes. Okay. Um, actually, I should confess that every single copy protein <coughs> or complex that we touch, for example, PRC2, we try the early leaf tumor, and every chromatin remodeler that we touch in a mutant, we change the dynamics of the loop formation. Uh, this one is one of the most efficient. I mean, if we touch LHP1, we reduce the formation of the loop by about 50%. And uh, we know that it binds to this region. Indeed, the, 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 the binding of this region is spread. It's not so, 
uh, restricted to H3, K27 triangulation that is spread, and the thing that is spreading is due to interaction with promising through the RNA uh, and not uh, only recognizing the, the modificated uh, system. Uh, we know also that there is another, we tested with, with another group, there is a BAF60 that is another chromatin remodeler that is affecting, um, it, it is in charge of relocalizing re nucleosomes, uh, it's affecting also loop formation and, uh, and it's regulating the and Apollo transcription. There are many interactors here. Actually, when I uh, put uh, TFs, transcription factors binding to both sides of the promoter. I'm pretty sure that uh, those are half transcription factors because they depend on uh, both uh, transcriptions. It uh, depends on uh, ARF 19 and ARF 7. And there are sites for uh, cis-acting element, potential cis-acting elements in there. And there is a paper showing that ARF transcription factors can conform homodimers uh, to remodel chromatin. So I'm pretty sure I have, I've never tried. The reviewers didn't ask for that, fortunately. But uh, I had seats there in the lab because I was wondering whether the action of transcription factors themselves could uh, conform or control the, the, the formation of the I'm, I'm not sure what is going on first. It is that the, the, the promoter is open and the transcription factors will come and recognize the size, or if this, the, 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 the transcription factors are essential to, to conform the, the, the What I can state is that the only mark that this is key for loop formation is DNA RNA dependent DNA methylation. All the rest we have tested, it affects the formation or the dynamics, but it cannot impair it and uh, impair it totally. Yeah, and the second question was uh, how is the phenotype of LHB mutants in terms of lateral root? LHB1 mutants? Yeah. Well, for roots it's very difficult. It's early, it is controlling F FLC, so it's very early flowering. I uh, you know if you know the mutant that's a plant like this with flowers and the roots are really they are nasty. <laughs> it's very difficult to, to analyze them. It, it wouldn't make sense to, to try to phenotype because even the, the root is very small in, in, a, in an agar plate and it's all already flowering. It's, it's very difficult to analyze. We, we, I, I tried once and it gave up very quickly. Um, uh, my question is, it is require an active uh, tier 1 uh, oxygen receptor for huh. oxygen to remove the loop? I don't know. I haven't tried the uh, oxygen receptor yet. No, I haven't tried what we, try, what we are trying now is to adapt it or after this proof of concept that we are using exogenous oxygen. We are trying to analyze this in a real developmental context. And we are trying to analyze how loop is conformed, uh, how it is behaving in unilateral formation. That is highly dependent on oxygen. My name is Doc. Okay. Uh, you said that loop opening requires DNA demethylation, yes. but uh, the triple mutant also has a lower basal level of the loop. Uh, the, the basal. The, the, High initial level. level. High level. High level. Yes. Okay. Sorry. So it's also DNA methyltransfer is included in this uh, response. Uh, there should be. There should be. Actually, I think that the, the later opening of, of the loop is not due to demethylation but to uh, cell division. By <coughs> cyclizing the, the formation of the lateral roots altogether, we will have new uh, new cells. And, and it will cause an imbalance of, of those because I think that this is so dynamic that is, there are methylated, met, methylated, methylating the locus and others coming and demethylating the locus depending on the root and on the root cell, especially because what we are measuring here is uh, the, the average of uh, methylation uh, of a mixture of cells uh, that we cannot really say up to now what cell is being methylated and what is being demethylated. And I'm pretty sure that. Uh, Methylation enzymes involved in what we confirm. Is there any question? We thank uh, Fede Ariel very much.